Hey everyone, happy Wednesday. Um, it's that time again. We are joined by a lovely uh, Shift Success member and friend, uh, the lovely Andrew Harding. Now, Andrew is a currently a serving police officer. Um, he is also the founder of Cycle Strength and is going to be sharing his journey from going from police officer to entrepreneur, ups and downs in both instances, and uh, he's going to be giving plenty of inspiration, I'm sure. So, Andrew, welcome to the uh, the show. Thanks very much, Alex. Good to have you. So um, I want to start things off with you as a person before the job, before the business. Uh, what was it like for you, like growing up uh, as a kid and, and where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm from uh, North London. Um, I've, I've always been a, a Londoner. Um, I, I, as it, you know, I was a pretty, um, I think a pretty normal childhood sort of in the, in the suburbs of London. Um, I, my older sister, who I was always looking up to, um, you know, uh, pretty pretty standard. No, nothing nothing stands out about my childhood at all. But I, <laughs> I can was you kind of the was you kind of the, a, a, was you a, a nerdy kid? Was you mm. an athletic kid? Was you always the... always sporty? Um, I was I was academic, but not in a nerdy way. Um, mm. So. I try. I, I tried really hard at school. I, I always tried hard at everything I do, um, almost to a fault. Where I, I've, I've found myself trying too hard with things. Um, mm -hmm. But um, going through like GCSEs and A levels, I just wanted to. I, I wanted those A's, you know. Um, and and anything less wasn't. Well, you know, I, I I felt like it wasn't good enough for me. So I just I just grafted all the way through school. Went to university um, and, and 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 joined the police. I was still in my final year of university when I joined the police. Oh, wow. Always looking for, you know, the, um, the 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 best result I could get out out of everything. Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that? Because because oh, people don't have that. Oh my god, my parents. Um, my uh, both both parents went to university and got a good job. My my dad was a civil servant, so I almost followed followed him because. He was all very, you know, work for the government. You'll always be, you know, you'll always have your pension. You'll always be looked after. You'll never be, you know, you'll never be made redundant. <laughs> all, of, all of that kind of stuff that, you know, the generation before us grew up with. Um, so it's, and it wasn't like, he, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't encourage me into the police, but I, I think he was a, um, uh, he, he made a sort of a, like a sounding board when I was thinking about it. He was like, "Yeah, you know, what what better career could there be than you know, thirty years in the police?" Yeah. So he kind of set that kind of standard in you as a young kid. Do well at school, to go to university, do well at university, yeah. and obviously go for a, a good, safe, secure job, which Ab which was the police. Absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah. Do you mind okay. if I drink coffee? Or no, of course. Yeah, it's completely fine. Um, so. You know, going from school and being pretty, being pretty okay with school, and you know, getting good grades. You go to university. What what did you study at university? Biology. Um, so I I've always been sort of sciencey, mathsy kind of kind of person. I I you know I did all right with the Englishy English kind of stuff. I'm dyslexic. Um, so something I I was diagnosed with at the age of about seven eight years old. Um, so I've always had um like um. Uh, I'm a slow reader, um, and I, I my spelling is shocking. I think my kids can spell better than I can. Actually, my son's he's he's got the dyslexic. He's, he's inherited it from me, and I spotted it really early on. But like the, the sort of, um, I, I, I've always always struggled with sort of English side of it. But sciencey, mathy stuff, absolutely fine. So I, I went down that route. Um, I uh, did a science degree. What better science is there than than biology? Because it sort of opens the doors to so many other things. Um, and and that also, I guess, in, in a way, um, I, I came back. I've, I've come back into that um, from yeah. a slightly different angle with the personal training. Um, yeah. it, it all like when I was doing the training for the personal training, like, like doing all the um, uh, the learning for it. Um, I, you know, reading through it, I was like, this is stuff I did at university. All of the anatomy stuff, I, I knew it already. So it, it, it it's come full circle. Yeah, absolutely. So, like at, at that age, you're going to go and go into universities to learn about biology, get a degree there. Um, what was in your mindset at that age? Because you know, 
obviously policing is not in your mindset there because it's completely like two ends of the spectrum, police and biology. So was there an intention for you to have a career in a certain area with that biology degree before you um, came across the police? Not, not really, no. So both parents encouraged me to go to university because they, you know, growing up through school, they could tell that that was something that I could do. So they encouraged it. And when I was thinking about what I was going to study, um, their advice was, what do you enjoy? Right. You know? um, I always, always like watching David Attenborough programs. So it's like, well, <laughs> why don't I go and do that? And I kind of thought, I think really naively, I thought I would go into doing a research kind of role, like be a biologist, whatever that is so vague. Like I know that now, yeah. but thought I was going to go and be a biologist, you know? Um, and certainly as a, as a younger, uh, younger person, I, 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 I kind of fancy going out and doing research like out of, you know, in the Arctic or in the rainforest or something like that. Um, then at university, I got a taste of that. Um, I went and spent a month in Indonesia studying frogs in like, you know, in rivers and I fucking hated it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. That's uh, it was, interesting. <laughs> It was it was not as cool as it looks on TV. <laughs> it, was, it, it was just hard. It was hard work. Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed the experience, but the actual uh, sort of the gathering data side. Of it, if I was there on holiday, it would have been way better. Um, but yeah, I, I think what it was while I was at university, I decided I don't want to be a biologist. I don't want to. I, I'm not going to yeah. do this um, as a career. So I had to pretty quickly switch and think of something else I could do as a as a career. Um, and having been that kind of biology uh, mind, my like all through school and through university, um, I started to panic. <laughs> uh, I can imagine. Yeah. 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 Um, thinking, oh, God, I've, 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 I've wasted my time. But um, the uh, at that time, I think it was in my final year at university. There was a massive recruitment drive, like for, for the police, like huge. And they had adverts, they had celebrities on TV. It was this sort of um, uh, the ad camp. People probably remember from twenty one years ago. About um, so I guess between nineteen twenty years ago, um, the uh, they had celebrities doing adverts, say like talking about a particular role that the police like. Um, delivering a death message to someone's parents after being into a car incident and, and, and saying, I couldn't do that. Could you, you know, it was, it right, was, that, was the, that was the ad campaign. Yeah. Um, and that, that really, that, I, I don't know, that, that kind of got me. I thought, I could die. Yeah, I could do that. I could go and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and incidentally, I had a couple of friends from school who, when I went to university, they joined the police. So they were, two years in at this time and absolutely loving it and they and I, I i hooked up with them and spoke to them about it um did a bit of research and 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 they 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 sold it to me as well they you know they were singing the praises oh it's great fun you know uh, buzzing around in cars and um doing what you do when you're a probationer you know um yeah. they, they they were loving it so i thought yeah why not you know it's, yeah. it's a job isn't it I, I, at the time i didn't have a job yeah it's a job and, it was, and they were crying out for people who joined so kind of just walked into it amazing and you'd obviously did that while she was actually still studying at university mm. um yeah. was it as good as you you know in, in your probationer uh friends was it as good as they made out when you first joined was it uh <laughs> um i think i felt differently about it just being a different person just yeah you know because they they did i think they did a levels or or um or the equivalent um I, I knew them from, I certainly knew them from sixth form, um, but they didn't go to university. So I had had different, like three years worth of different experience to them. Um, and I think also just being that a little bit older, you know, being 23 when I joined instead of 19, mm. that kind of made it feel a bit different. Um, yeah. You know, I was living, I, I was living with my girlfriend at the time um, when I joined. So I didn't go to Hendon and, um and stay like i i, I didn't live at hendon yeah um because I, I had a i was renting a, an apartment in london um mm. my girlfriend who was working yeah. uh, she was working for google and you know bringing it home so wow. imagine yeah, <laughs> so yeah so I, I i had a very different experience just going through the training um and you know 
the the, the early years of being in the police to to what uh, how my friends had told me. Got you, got you. It makes absolute sense. Um, so what force was it you end up joining? Metropolitan Police. Yeah. Oh, cool. So you joined the Met. Um, and throughout your career, like what kind of roles have you done in uh, in twenty years? Um, I um, I did the the, the, the standard stuff. People always used to do. I don't think they. It's, well, it's very, I know it's very different now. Um, I I did my, my probation. Went on to the response team. Um, and then safer neighbourhoods came out it, it was um piloted i was in camden at the time working on the borough of camden and camden was a pilot borough for safer neighborhoods so i put my hand up like i'll get out get out a team get out like answering 999 calls um i'd had enough of that after a couple of years so i went to safer neighborhoods says a pilot thing and thought i was just you know all new and um this is the way forward. it turns out it is actually um i did that for like I don't know, like four years, I was a PC on them. While I was there, I applied for CID and I moved to Hackney to become a DC um, after, I guess, about seven years in the job. And I've been a DC ever since. So it took me a couple of years to, to become a DC um, in Hackney. Um, I did all the exams and everything. Um, uh, uh, so, I, yeah, I was in Hackney then for another seven years um just doing the rounds as a borough dc um and that was pretty exhausting and actually i think that was the worst role um i've been in in the police and i think it, even now if you ask anyone any detective uh you come across they will say that borough cid is the hardest the worst and most thankless task you can do because it's just not enough of you and uh yeah just like the workload, the relentlessness. But, but, yeah, it's, yeah, and and the early, late nights. Um, you come in, you can come in to work on a Monday morning, haven't had the weekend off. You come in on a Monday morning, it's like bang. There's like five prisoners in the bin for you. And you're like, right, so who's going to help me with this? Wow. Ah, shit, I'm on my own. <laughs> I've got five prisoners to interview and process, and so I'll phone up. You know, sorry, I'm not coming home tonight. Um, yeah. It was just, it was just hideous. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, 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 I managed to um, get into a, like a proactive role mm. on the borough, um, which was fantastic. Um, there was this little, little little job going, a small team. One DS had set up this little team um, and was looking for three DCs, and and I, I got, I got the job. Did a proactive job for like a year and a half, just scribbled away, just doing um, do, doing sort of stuff involving bits of surveillance and um, test purchases and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that that then set me up because I, I went from that into um, it was London Crime Squad at the time, but it was a sort of a proactive um, uh, proactive wing. Um, and, and and I've been this. So it's it the London Crime Squad change it, it was you know um doing proactive jobs for boroughs and then it became like they, they, they call them syndicates and now it's yeah it's still syndicates actually but it, it then it's like you know met wide um proactive policing a whole team of dcs who are all surveillance trained and and that was the best job um i could have had um it was really uh, that was a, a really good like it was exciting. All the jobs were good, sort of high, much higher level than on the boroughs, um, and everyone you're working with has been handpicked because they 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 want to be there and they want to work. So you're working with a really really good team, um, and I I love that job. Um, but it was it was that job that then changed um, changed my life because I was burying myself in the job. Um, you know I. Had a, I had a, a surveillance vehicle on my driveway and I, if the phone went at 10 o'clock at night I could be at home you know about to go to bed and the phone would go I've got to be in Leicester in an hour wow. yeah fine I'll be there yeah sure yeah. Wow. wow what uh, um, jump in the car <laughs> um and and it, it was that kind of expectation you drive a car home you go from straight from the plot home you've got the car there if they phone you and say you've got to come back in you've got a car you can't say no so you they got you but then the times when they don't say no it's like you can be home at two in the afternoon and uh and it's you know mm. 
that's that's, that's absolutely crazy so before we go into kind of the thing that you know change your life um mm. uh, and i want to talk about um how does because because i can't comprehend that i, I can't call me at night call me in the morning i've got to be this location that location you know surveillance vehicles around you how does your family cope with that you, you know you're you're the you're the dad you're you're the husband how does family deal with that your, your kids and, and your wife good question i have absolutely bloody no idea because at the time i it didn't figure because i was doing i was in that role before my kids were born um so they grew up with a dad who this is what dad does like oh, yeah so missing birthday parties and i miss christmas once wow like literally i <laughs> turning up at my in-laws house and the phone went and it's christmas day and the phone goes and i'm just walking down literally walking down the driveway the in-laws to um to have christmas dinner and the phone goes and i've got to be somewhere i'm like yeah i'm fine yeah have a nice christmas everyone gone um how does that make you feel as a, as a... Oh, well, I, it's just it seems ridiculous now because i've got I've, I, now i've taken a step back i'm like i'm, I'm on the outside looking at it yeah. Um, and it, 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 it's crazy. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, cause it was what I was used to is what I was, and, and like I said, my kids grew up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it wasn't like I changed and I had to adapt from being a family dad to then having this role. It was the other way around. I was, a, I was in that role. I became a dad. And so I was kind of, I feel bad about this. I was kind of like an absent dad, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, the, yeah. like, the number of weekends i probably worked one in three weekends um so there were so so many things i missed yeah i think you know baby from from babies till um well my son's 10 now but um yeah he would have been seven when when uh it all changed so um yeah I, i'm not yeah i i truth is i don't know what it was like at home because i wasn't there yeah yeah Okay. I, I mean, by the way, you, you're not alone. I, I think a, a lot of cops go through that just due to the nature of the job. Mm. Uh, and it's great that you've got perspective now, right? You know, yeah, doing, yeah. What, doing what you do now and, you know, you, you are around and you've got this thriving business and, you know, you're building something special for you and your family. I think it's amazing, which we'll get on to. So at this point, you've got this job in the, in the job, you're missing time with family. It's a bit hectic. What's next for you um, beyond that kind of hectic life? You're a dad now and, you know, you're still in the job. What, what happens? So what, 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 what was I thinking? Where was I? What was no, my... just like, what, what happened? Do you stay in that job for, you know, until your kids are, you know, X years or how, how long do you stay in that role in the job where it's so hectic? Do you go into a different department or, or what? So I, I was, I was in that, uh, yeah, I was in that role. I, I kind of moved around different teams, but doing the same, performing the same role as a detective on a surveillance capable team. Um, I worked with the NCA in, um, on, on one of the teams. I would, that, that was the last role I was in um and uh and the, and I and I was I was gonna stay there I had no um no actually that's a lie and I think you know you know that I I got the shift to success book it came I, I, I don't remember why I think it pinged up on Facebook or something something came and I went oh that's interesting mm. um there, there, there could be a there could be a job that I could do that isn't this. And I, I, I'd never even considered it. I'm just out of interest. Like I hadn't even, I hadn't even like, I didn't, you know. Consider, probably, but you didn't consider business. Yeah, it, yeah. it was weird. It, it was it, it actually quite frightening, the timing of it. Cause then I had a phone call, I think with um, probably Monia actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, to, to, to say, oh, so you've got the book. Have you started reading it? I was a bit like, oh no, I haven't actually yes, yeah. yeah, sat on my bedside table. I haven't opened it yet. Um, <laughs> And uh, two weeks later, I, I had a stroke. Um, I, mm. I, I, and it was the timing of the stroke to me says a lot as well because I'd just done ten like ten days solid. I worked from Monday right the way through the weekend. Finished on the Thursday, um, like Thursday night because like, it was a big job. You know, everything's a big job in the Met. Isn't it? Big job, big job. Nicking people down in. Um, uh down in uh, kent and processing prisoners and finished at like 10 o'clock on the thursday night having just grafted for 
solidly for the last 10 days. I was so relieved I, and got charges and everything. So it was all high fives. So it was, it was worth to me. It was worth it. Like you've done all this hard work. It's worth it. We got charges. I hadn't seen my kids for 10 days. Um, so I came home, had a beer, told the missus all about it, went to bed and I got up and it, again, crazy. I got up at like half six in the morning, jumped out of bed. Like, I'm going for a run. I haven't had any exercise. I mean, sat in a surveillance car where I've been in a custody suite for the last 10 days. Mm. I'm going to go for a run and just enjoy the nice weather. It was, um, it was July. Yeah, it was July. Yeah. 17th of July. Um, and yeah, I was going to go out and have, and have a run. I put my running stuff on, went downstairs and I had a stroke right there on the kitchen floor. Um, managed to drag myself to the sofa and like lay on the sofa and just stroked it out. Oh, that sounds terrible. Doesn't stroked it, it out. <laughs> <laughs> Lay it on the sofa and stroked it out. <laughs> I know what you meant, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I, I I don't know how long I was here. I was out for I was out for like forty five minutes to an hour or something. My, my wife was in bed uh, and I, she got up and had a shower and then came downstairs. My, my kids had come downstairs and seen me and thought oh, that's weird. Dad's on the sofa. Get out of it. This just left me to it. Um, and I, uh, yeah, as, as my wife came down the stairs, I sort of like started sitting up and I'm like, oh, weirdest thing. I just like feel like I fainted or like I didn't know what had happened. I genuinely had no idea what happened. Um, but uh, yeah, she was sort of like, well, that's, that's odd, isn't it? Um, people don't just faint. So let's have a, let's, uh, we called the doctor. It's about eight, eight o'clock in the morning. So um, I think we phoned, yeah, phoned 911, I think. And they they actually said, well, you probably better go to the hospital. So they kind of booked me an appointment at Kingston Hospital for the afternoon. So I sat around all morning. And it was in that time when I was talking rubbish. Like my my um, vocabulary had gone. And this happens with stroke. Like when people have had a stroke, they, they lose words or their words get mixed up. And we had some sandwiches for lunch and I was sort of, I, 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 I don't know, I was calling things the wrong things and getting over, everything. Well, my kids thought it was hilarious. My <laughs> wife was deeply concerned. Um, and then I went, went to the hospital. I was given this massive ream of instructions of places to go and things to do when I got there. It was during COVID time, so no one was allowed to come in with me. So I had to go in, wear a mask and kind of dodder around like and that it kind of hit me then i had absolutely no idea what was going on my brain was gone like um i was i i didn't have um like a a side that had kind of flopped you know like you've got a, sort of classic stroke symptoms is that um a asymmetry uh and and like loss of function in one side but i didn't have that to any kind of noticeable extent i mean i do have a little you know a little bit of like they had some studies afterwards and they said there was a bit of that but it's not like no one would notice um mm -hmm. so i managed to get through all these things at six o'clock in the evening almost 12 hours after it happened the doc i'm in with a doctor and he's op opens this thing reads through all the bits of tests all i've had done and he goes oh well you've had a stroke like a full-blown stroke not even like you know you get um like there's levels of strokes is different different ones no, no that, that was a proper stroke so then i had to go to um the stroke specialists in a different hospital and they didn't have any ambulances so i had to call my wife she had to come and pick me up and drive me and i didn't get there till like eight o'clock in the evening just it's a bit of a joke really it should be like an ambulance right when the, you see on the tv like if you're having a stroke or yeah. like you see someone you think's having a stroke call 999 get them in an ambulance get them to the hospital mm. um no that didn't happen it was like it was like a solid 24 20 um sorry no like um 14 hours until i actually got to the stroke specialists at, at uh, st george's hospital in london um but yeah i've come out of it okay i'm all right you, ha you have i mean how old was you when had when you had the stroke 29 no 39 sorry 39, 39. yeah 39. So, so i remember when, when we spoke you, you was talking about you was reading the book and you mentioned to me that you'd had a stroke and mm -hmm. um, to see, you know, for the many years, you know, what, two, two and a half years now we've known each other, Andy, yeah. um, to see where you were, that first conversation I had with you, you were 
um, slower in talk and you were, mm -hmm. you know, um, thoughtful in your words. And now you're like a, you're a different person, mate. You're like, you're, you're snappy. You're, you know, you, you're, you know, smashing this podcast. You're, you're very, you know, on the ball. And, you know, I've definitely seen that, that improvement. Um, and I, you know, I've seen my granddad have a stroke. I was there as, as a young, I was probably about 14 years old. He went, he did go limp. Mm -hmm. The paramedics had to like squeeze his finger to get a response from him and stuff like that. Um, and, and that was horrible. And, and for you to go through that, um, you know, with your, with your kids and, and your family in, in the, in the house, you know, I, I couldn't imagine how, you know, horrible that is. Um, you mentioned that you didn't know what was happening during your time and it was almost like a surreal experience. You fainted. Yeah, um, yeah. were there any other symptoms that you can think of or, or recall during the time? So people, you know, watching this, you know, God forbid, if they have a, a, a stroke, um, is there anything that you can remember that, you know, was a bit out of the ordinary from a symptom point of view? Um, well, I, I, it came, it, it wasn't like, so, like, it wasn't like I was standing up and then suddenly flat out. Yeah. It came on really like quite slowly. Like I felt I was, I was standing in my kitchen and I, I started to feel a bit dizzy. And then I started to like, I, I guess I started to black out, but I, it was only one side. When I think of it now, I can rationalize it and I can tell, oh, yeah, it's just so obviously having a stroke. Like I, I felt my, my, my right side start to not quite work. I think I was trying to hold something. I was probably holding a cup of coffee or something and I couldn't pick yeah. it up. And I started yeah. to, and I, and I can feel myself listing, like, okay, you know, I'm going, I'm going here. Yeah, so I, I was holding onto the worktop, and I like like kind of inched along the worktop, holding myself up, probably leaning on my left arm. Jesus, my right one had gone. Um, and then I'm like along the holding the backs of the chairs to get to, over to the sofa in the living room. So I'm like holding on to stuff, kind of limping along. Um, uh, and then and then I just uh, yeah I, I hit the sofa and I was gone. Um, and I don't know how long for but it you know must have been about 45 minutes to an hour that i was out for bloody hell um, it's, it was i suppose it's a good job your wife and, and kids are in um yeah they, they were home but no one did anything about it it would have been good if someone had actually seen it happen and been like wow you're having a stroke no 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 like yeah yeah but, yeah it was, it was just it, it's my own stupid fault for that he get well it could have happened in my sleep people have strokes in their sleep don't yeah they? that's right absolutely if it happened a half an hour earlier i would have still been in bed mm. but it would have happened in my sleep and i just wouldn't have been able to wake up Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, I, I, I kind of like laugh about it now, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad because I'm okay. Because I'm like, thank God I'm okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's just one of those, one of those things, you know, when you get, you know, when you get through something like that, then you're like, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sure, I'm assuming it gives you a different perspective on life. Um, oh, yeah. Looking, for real. Yeah. You're right. Look in hindsight. If he was, a, if he was in bed and that happened, that could have been, you might not be here. Um, Andy, what do you think? Now I'm assuming I know the answer to this, but do, um, my my granddad when he had a stroke, he was caring for my mum. Uh, sorry, grandma who had muscular cirrhosis, so she was incontinent all the time. You know, he was very stressed dealing with that. Um, she was like kind of losing herself during that time as well, and he had a a few strokes caused by stress. Mm. Would you would it be fair to say that? due to the nature of the job not seeing your kid or your family for 10 days working back to back monday to sunday or whatever it was that what that was a factor in what happened big time yeah i i'm i'm 100 convinced that it was stress from the job but i didn't realize i was suffering mm. that caused it um i had a million tests done um i was off work for nine months uh, recovering from the stroke I'm like you said I'm okay now yeah, that's, yeah. I, I am okay now but yeah I mean I couldn't I couldn't talk I couldn't remember stuff I, you know I was in a pretty pretty bad way like and I, and I was I got like depressed about it as well um so I had, had that on top of just the sort of recovering from something that's happened to actually feeling really shit about everything like well that's the end of my life oh well you know thanks very much um I had a during that time, I was in the hospital like every other week, getting some kind of test done, so something scanned, some, um, I, you know, doing this 
draw a, a map of a zoo, kind of like weird tests that, you know, yeah. I can't remember them properly, but like draw this, where, how would you walk around a zoo and see all the animals? Sounds like a kid's game, but it was, yeah. you know, bloody difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and they found, oh, well, there's no reason for you to have had a stroke. There's no, I, I, fit, healthy guy, um, no, not a smoker, not overweight. Um, uh, I, you know, I exercised, I've always exercised regularly. Um, I didn't have I like high cholesterol or blood pressure problems. I, you know, nothing, none of the, the red lights that say, yeah, you know, rain that in or you're going to have a stroke. Yeah. I didn't have any of that. The only thing that, that leaves one thing that can't, they can't actually prove it. You can't actually like have a, a letter from a doctor saying, stress but it's the only thing that's left is stress and and the only thing giving me stress was work because that was the only thing i bloody did yeah. anything else um yeah it wasn't my family that, that had stressed me out and the, the timing of it as well like coming off of such a long period of like just grafting hard that that i mean that that 10 day period that i'd done uh, um that was kind of the end of a job that had lasted a, a good few months and it kind of culminated and just you know uh, anyone who is in the police knows that you'll work really hard at something and then it, it 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 comes to a crescendo when you actually arrest people and that is the longest hardest day um of the whole operation it, it could have been a year and a half long it could have been two weeks long but that day when you nick people is that's the hardest work you, you, you'll do uh, and that's what I'd done the night before, finished that the night before, and then just had a stroke when I woke up. So, um, yeah, there isn't a doubt in my mind that it was yeah. work stress that caused it. Yeah. Yeah. Make, yeah, it makes absolute sense. Um, so at this point, obviously, you know, you join Shift Success and you think about going into business. And I remember we discussed some few ideas that potentially could go down. And um, I think one of them, one of the first ones, like a gravel bike idea one of the initial yeah. ones and then you basically thought of an idea which is now a very fully fledged business working yeah. with customers everywhere called cycle strength do you want to explain to the listeners and viewers what cycle strength is and what you do yeah absolutely so uh, i'm a personal trainer um for cyclists i concentrate on on cyclists and i offer online personal training programs for cyclists to get off the bike and get into the gym or use um, equipment at home so that they can improve their stability, strength and power and, and improve the comfort of their rides, the distance of their rides and just smash those goal pieces. And my clients are loving it. Um, it's, a, it's a different take when you speak to someone who uh, is, um, you know, training for a big ride, ride London coming up in a in, in about a month or just over a month. Um, they'll be like, "Oh, I'm I'm going out on my bike all the time." Well, I tell you something different. I'd say, "Well, yeah, go out on your bike a lot, but actually, it's getting off the bike, it's getting the work done in the gym that really makes your body able to cope with being on a bike." Uh, so, and it's something that I have done. I've, I've I've been a cyclist since I was in my twenties. Yep. Uh, I've I've been training in the gym since I was a teen. I played rugby um, and started training in the gym when I was about seventeen years old. So I've been in the gym my whole adult life. Yeah, and I've been on a bike for you know since I was in my twenties. And it had never occurred to me that people don't train in the gym for cycling. Yeah, um, yeah. and. Uh, it, I, I, yeah it, it's just it, it's you combine the two right you combine the two yeah. that you were doing into this business which is yeah is working yeah. yeah exactly exactly so all, all i had to do is I, I had to get qualified um to to be able to to, to deliver the training because you can't just you know, you know anyone anyone can't just go and tell people how to train because you, you have to be you have to be qualified and have insurance and all that stuff of course so i joined join shift and success without a clue of what i wanted to do um right um I, I i figured cycling it would be cycling because that's what i was into um and and then i just had to look at myself and think what do i do and what's missing from the world uh well it's, it's obvious isn't it um <laughs> it, it took a few months i think yeah. I, it was, uh about three months before i actually hit the idea and then i, I think i'd 
I was a little bit reluctant to then fork out the money for the training that I had to do for the, to get the qualifications to become a personal trainer. And it was during lockdown. So there was no, it all had to be done online. Um, uh, and and doing the practical stuff, I had to wait for that until gyms opened up again. Um, so it's a bit bit of a tricky time to do it. Um, but yeah, it it, it it's you know I, I I I couldn't possibly look back with any regret over any of that because mm. it's yeah it's 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 working and it's it's doing doing great things for my clients as well. I'm, yeah. Like getting um. Just, just getting like the, the reviews, even if it's not even like a, a review or a testimonial, even if it's just like a couple of sentences or in a message saying, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been to the gym today. I've absolutely smashed it. I'm like, yeah, brilliant. And I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. It feels so much better than nicking someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. It's, I like, I'm, it's helping people. I'm working with people and I'm helping them. Yeah. It's not like that police officer who's going out to, to arrest people i know police officers help people but it doesn't yeah. always it doesn't always feel like that whereas yeah. this is different this is like come, come to me and i will help you yeah i i completely get it you're you know you're at the end of the day you're a coach you're, you're a personal trainer and exactly. i think the impact that you make is very different because number one you're dealing with people under a different environment and different circumstances but also it's like it's coming from you personally your business and i think it's a very yeah. deep and meaningful relationship that you can have with the client so i completely understand and you know, people you're nicking, they're definitely not going to be wishing any love like that. So um, yeah, completely makes sense. So talk to you about your clients. Um, so are they clients who are like, they're competitive bikers? Or are they um, Joe Bloggs who likes to go out every weekend with his friends on the, on the, on the, uh, on the gravel bike or on the road? Who's kind of your typical kind of customer? Would you so say? I've got, I've got a range of, of clients. Um, I've got, I've, I've gone international. I've got two from, I've got one in California and one on the East coast, uh, sort of near New York. Um, the rest are UK. Um, and the, the majority, in fact, I think all of them, cause I, I almost stipulate that this is a thing you've got to have a goal. So you, you've got to cut, you, you, you don't just say, I just want to get better at cycling. Yeah. Cause you need a goal. You're going to have something to aim for. So I, e even if the first time I speak to someone on this, I know I haven't got anything, I will say, well, go and book a ride. Go and, you've got to pay the money to be in an event. And that's yeah. that's what you're training for. So that actually gives it a, like a tangible, like a, a, like a skin in the game kind of thing. Yeah, it makes it real. It, makes it, it gives you a purpose for training. Otherwise, it's just, I just want to get better at cycling. Well, great. I mean, you can be better at cycling tomorrow. Yeah, smart goals, isn't it? Um, how is it going to be measurable uh, and, and and put a timing on it? So in three months, I've got this big ride that I've booked in for and I've told everyone I'm doing it. And I've told, not only have I told everyone I'm doing it, I've told everyone I'm going to do 100 miles in five hours. Yeah. Right, you've got to train for that. So yeah. let's go, let's go. That's that's my only thing. Um, apart from that, so I, I've got, um, uh, I've, I've had a, a client who is a, 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 an athlete the great britain the triathlete um wow. uh he, i've got um i've got a couple of mountain bikers who are doing events going up to scotland one's going up to scotland this weekend to to take part in uh national rounds of, of the downhill cup mm -hmm. i've got um I've, I've got others who are uh one guy who's been cycling since like september and he started cycling and thought wow this is hard i need a coach like ab absolute beginner but he's got he's got those goals he's got something this year coming up in the summer that he he's training for so perfect so yeah so it's it's a full range full range of people amazing and you know i think that's an important lesson for people to take is that sometimes a lot of people when they like if you think of a pt you think oh you've got to be in the gym at location that's not the case you've got an online clientele working with people across the world which creates a lot more distribution scale for the business and i think sometimes for a police officer you know who's not in business to understand that that it, sometimes it's a bit um a bit mind blown at first to think what i can work with people in california or yeah. or wherever based because of the technology um cool oh, okay yeah yeah it's, it's it's having the being able to deliver the training online that's that's the, that's the thing that's really blown it open. And I think actually COVID helped that because a, a lot of trainers, were, you know, you, gyms were shut. So yeah, all of those PTs 
they either lost their revenue or yeah. they had to shift to an online thing and all these online um sort of ways of delivering training is it's really come about or, or it's definitely been home during covid times and and, it, and you know that's when i that's when i took it up so right at kind of the the edge or i guess the sort of spearhead of um of it going yeah. online big online clients uh yeah. no yeah. Uh, uh coaches even coaching yeah. the clients online yeah yeah, yeah. shift success uh, we we went online fully due to covid um mm. and it was one of the best business decisions that we ever made and it just yeah. opened uh, you remove the bottleneck and you know things start to take off even more so i think it, it's helped a lot of people out there if they change a lot of people didn't adapt and they suffered and i think that was important to uh to understand as well so your clients they come across what kind of problems do they come to you with is it like Andy or Andrew, I need to knock off a minute off this time or five minutes or, or is it, I'm just, you know, lasting the full hour. What kind of, so, again, a, ra a range of things. Um, probably the most, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the most common couple will be, I've got, uh, I've got a, a, a load of events booked in for the summer. Um, I've been training, I'm, I'm a, uh, like a category b or c or whatever you know can, um if you're racing if you've got a race license then you're categorized um so a being the highest and so on um so they'll come to me and say i'm a category b i'm kind of at the back of b i want to win the b races and maybe move into category a so that's that's the competitive guys it's always like well, and girls you know, always be like want to move up a category um i've actually got a load of people who ride Zwift races, Zwift, like the online, again, something came yeah. out of COVID, Zwifting. Yeah. Um, is, that like the is that like a Peloton thing? Is it similar? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really competitive and um, and you can uh, categorize for that. And you, if you want to move up and, and race um, in, a, in a higher category, you've got to train. You can't just ride. You can't just race all the time. Um, so it, it, it's, it's either that or it's, I've had an injury and mm. I've been off cycling for i don't know anything between three weeks to a year um I had, uh, i've had a client who got hit by a car um and uh, and, and was recovering from that I, I had a client who um uh, broke his hip he fell off his bike and um hit you know, hit a pothole fell off his bike broke his hip and and just then couldn't ride with his mates anymore because he lost all his fitness so hello we can do this. Yeah, it's like six weeks later, he's back riding with his mates, and he's it's been a couple of years, and he's been scratching his head. How can I get fit again? Yeah, I've got I've got you, mate. I've got, yeah, <laughs> I love that. Absolutely love it. Um, so you've done phenomenally well. So you work with clients, you know, across the world now. Um, you built a client base. Uh, we had a, a little talk before we went live this podcast, and and this quarter you've exceeded your, your police wage, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, and, you know, for a person who's, you know, been in the job, you know, for 20 years, gone yes. through a stroke, had no business idea to now exceeding your police income, it is absolutely phenomenal. And you should be very, very proud of yourself. Where do you see the vision? Where do you see your business going in the next kind of, you know, three to five years? What, what do you want to hit out to visualize? Well, um, I, I'd like it. I'd like to become one of those brands like, like we, we talked about Zwift and we talked about Peloton. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's coaches out there. Um, uh, uh, Joe Wicks, for example, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. why, why can't I be the Joe Wicks uh, for cyclists? Joe Wicks is very, very good. What he does is it, it's amazing. It's really non-specific and it's, aimed at people who don't have a sport that they're exercising for. So that's everyone, right? Yeah. He's, he's, like everyone's got all the coaches out there are like, right, I'm training for this sport, football, rugby, cycling, you know, whatever, martial arts, all this. He's like, don't worry about that. Let's just get you fit. Right. Mm. You know, anyway, so I, I love that. I love it. And he, and he, again, lockdown made him a household name. Um, I, I I'd like to be the Joe Wicks of of cycling. I love that. I absolutely love that. And uh, 
yeah, I agree. Joe Wicks is uh, is pretty cool what he does, especially that kind of the marketing angle he does. I think is uh, really really interesting. Um, if anyone kind of, in fact, yeah, if anyone who's like a bit you know in the job right now, listen to your story um, as a family man, husband, um, and a father who is stressed, who is missing time with their family, hasn't seen them for seven days or whatever, missing Christmases, birthdays. Um, and really kind of in a stressful state right now for you, who's been through such a, um, an experience with their health, um, a bad experience. Um, what words of wisdom would you give to that person who's currently going through that? You got to speak to your line manager. Um, and and there's actually, there's actually a lot of help in the police now. Um, there's um, there's a, a, a loads of services um, that that are there to help. But what you've got to do is recognise it in the first place. I didn't recognise it. Mm. I would have carried on, and it, it, you know, if if I hadn't if I hadn't gone the shift to success, I think I probably would have gone back into the same role. Mm. Um, after after been um uh deemed fit to fit fit, fit for duty um you've got to recognize it you've got to look at yourself and you've got to um realize like when was the last time I, I i spent some quality time with my family if it was a week ago mm. then that is i mean it's every day you should be you should if, if you can go, if you go a week and you, th- and you think, oh, I haven't seen my kids at all this week. I live in the same house as them, mm. but I haven't seen them because they're in bed when I get up to go to work. They're in bed when I get home. Then you've got to change something. You've got to put your hands, talk to your line manager, put your hand up and just say, look, I, I need, I need, to, I need some time. Um, so, cause th- these things are way more important than a job. Any job, um, not just police, any job. Um, and there is this the, the, the culture in the police of you've got to be the one who's always there. You, certainly in the, the roles that I was doing, um, if if you if you're the one who's always there, you're dependable. You get that you get a buzz out of just being the dependable guy. You know, we need someone who we can trust. Safe pair of hands. Yeah, there's Andy. He's always here. You, he'll get the job done. That's a great feeling. But what about your family? What you know? Yeah. They're missing you. They're missing you. And they can fucking miss you when you're dead. They're going to miss you loads then. Don't let that happen. You, you, you're right. I, you know, I've part of content before. Like, if you if you did drop dead, you'd be replaced within a week. But your family yeah, yeah. Would, yeah, for real. would miss you for the rest of their lives. And I think mm. sometimes that that needs to be brought into the forefront of people's mind, I think, um, especially with you going through what you, you went through um, and sharing that inspirational story to others. I think people need to recognize it more. Um, and I appreciate for sharing what, you, what you've what you been through, Andy. I think it is uh, enlightening for a lot of people. Going back to um, business, um, what kind of skill sets do you believe that you've brought into the world of business, into your own business that, you've kind of uh, accumulated as a police officer over 20 years? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's work ethic mm. because I, I've, I mean, I've, I think I've already made it clear. I was the, I was the guy who was always at work. I couldn't, I couldn't put a job down. I wouldn't walk out uh, mm. if I needed to do something. I wouldn't walk out. Mm. Uh, and I would do my damnedest to make sure colleagues were coping as well and if they needed help i would help uh and that's that's what i'm doing now you know I, i'm not going to walk out on my clients i'm not yeah. gonna if someone needs help if someone you know i've got an app like um i've got an app it's got a messenger in it if someone texts me i'll, I'll i'm on it um i will know if, if if I'm with another client or it's 10 o'clock at night, then yeah, obviously within reason, mm-hmm. but I want to help that. I want, you know, I want them to get their, the best results they can get. So I'm going to pull out all the stops to, to be there for them and help them out with it. Um, 
and and I don't let anything get in the way of that. So there's there's I think that's just the way I am. I don't that is not something I've got from from being a police officer, but that is something that helped me be successful as a police officer. Yeah, and is is now something that I'm leaning on in in a in a um, in, in a role where I'm providing a service. I think that's essential. Um, just having that having that work ethic. Um, I've, like, I've, I've learned so much stuff. I've had, I've had to learn about a million and one different ways of using a computer. Um, yeah. I didn't know about um, all these sort of programs and software that you get to... <laughs> to it's to funny. Hopefully through your business that I didn't even know existed when I was a cop. You know, you don't... You, yeah. you, you're, you're lucky if you know how to use Excel. <laughs> it, it's very true what you said there. It's like there's Athena, there's Niche, there's other things as well. And that was just in custody. I was in custody, right? So I, you had a lot more access, especially you have access to things as well. But you have all these systems. And sometimes I speak to cops and they're like, oh, no, I'm a technophobe. I'm like, really? Are you? Because you you deal with softwares that the general public just don't deal with. And you still crap. have to do that in your day. Yeah. You, you deal, you, the general public won't deal with them because they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, true. That's very, very true. And I'm like, yeah, well, you've obviously, you can obviously figuring it out because you're using it in the job, even though they are crap. So um, for you, I'm, su- I'm assuming, even though you dealt with those crap softwares, you've been yeah. able to transfer that into building an online yeah. business, right? Being be able to get my head around stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and it, it's, it's having like, having a, a bit of time pressure as well. Like I've got to get my head around this. Like I'm going to sit down and do it now. I'm not going to put it off for a week or two weeks and, because you know when you as well you know you're running your own business no one's telling you what to do you haven't got anyone breathing down your neck saying oh no you've got to be here and do that and you know you 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 haven't logged on today you know no one's doing that it's all it's all on you yeah um but that actually makes it more for me that makes it more important that i do these things uh i'm I'm, yeah i'm my own i'm my own uh boss i'm I'm the dragon breathing down my own neck, I think. Yeah, I love that. Um, hey, where can people find out about you? Where, you know, what's your website? Where can people um, reach out to you? Okay, so I've, I've got a website. It's um, uh, cyclestrengthpt.com. Um, I have a, a Facebook group, um, which is Strength and Fitness Training for Cyclists. If you if you put that in your Facebook search, you'll find it. Um, uh uh yeah i mean that's uh instagram i'm on instagram as well um just cycle strength if you as one word yeah um cycle strength is my handle across everything actually on facebook and everything um so yeah you can find it that way amazing guys um, i've seen some of the phenomenal results that andrew's getting for his clients if you are interested in you know, cycling, getting involved in cycling, or maybe you're a cyclist right now and you want to perform better. He is the man to go to. He is achieving some pretty awesome and epic results with his clients. Um, Andrew, one of the um, last things I like to ask everyone who joins this uh, this show is for you personally, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a scary word, isn't it? It's one of like something out of dragon's den you're thinking oh entrepreneurship it, it isn't uh anything to be scared of it is just going out and getting a get making a business for yourself it's better in yourself it's doing something for yourself um that's what it's come to mean for me and every little small step like i didn't i didn't expect to um, like on day one of joining Shift to Success to suddenly have a business, you know, it took it took me, like I said, it took me like three months just to get the idea in the first place. And then I had to do the training to be able to make the idea come true. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's working hard for, for, for your own business um, without anyone else telling you what to do. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Andrew, I just want to say as well, from on behalf of myself and the team, um, we're so proud of you. You've achieved some amazing things going from no business idea to now building this global business, working with clients all across the world, going through what you've been through with your own health battles and, and having a stroke. Uh, I hope to God that it doesn't happen again. Um, and also being honest and transparent about, you know, 
um, your situation in the job in terms of you know not seeing family and the words of wisdom you have to provide to our listeners. Um, I have no doubt that your business is going to go to amazing highs. And this is just the start of your journey. And um, I'm really excited to watch that happen. Um, so thank you for your inspiration. Thank you for sharing um, your insight in uh, into the job and also insight into the business world. And um, yeah, thanks. For having, thanks. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And I wouldn't have been able to do any of it without shift to success. I am so thankful for all the support that I had um, from those early days, getting me out of the fog of just felt useless um, to actually realizing something now. It's, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have known where to start and just putting one foot in front of the other is, uh, is, is the, the biggest help that I, I could have had. So thank you very much. I, hope. I appreciate the words. Thanks, mate. All right, guys. So um, this sh- podcast episode is going to be launched on the um, podcast platform itself next week. Um, it's going to be on the YouTube channel um, later this week. And also you can watch it back in the Facebook group at any time you want, uh, because I'm going to leave it there. Again, Andrew, thank you so much for your time, mate. Really inspirational, uh, really excited for your future. And uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. See you all soon.